Welcome to the Investor News. In this video, Jim Rickards talks about the challenges and opportunities in economic crises and the importance of seeing things coming through complex analysis. This is what he says. Just at a very high level, um, I would say that there are a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges. We'll talk about all of them in detail. You know, people put words in your mouth and kind of get the reputation as this doom and gloom guy. You know, Jim Rickards is always talking about the end of the world, which I don't. I never talk, use, use that expression. But I make the point that, yeah, despite the difficulties, we don't have to be victims. We're not helpless. We don't have to curl up in a ball. It, the, the key is to see it coming. If you can see things coming, you can deal with them accordingly. You can get through them, not only preserve wealth, but actually make money. I always uh, point out the example of um, Hugo Stinnes, and people go, well, who's that? Uh, he was an industrialist in Weimar, Germany in the early 1920s, and he could see the hyperinflation coming long before the middle class, long before anybody else. He went out and borrowed an enormous amount of Reichsmark, so that, that was the currency at the time, and just bought industrial assets, coal mines, uh, vessels, you know, natural resources, etc. So here comes the hyperinflation. He gives it a little time. He pays back his debts. I would say you know, pennies on the dollar, like a millionth of a penny on the dollar, in other words. Uh, but he paid it back. They were sweeping the money down the sewers, but he paid back his debts and kept all the assets. And he became the richest man in Germany. And my German is not very good, but his nickname was the Inflationskönig, which means the inflation king. So there are other stories like it, Joseph Kennedy in the 1929 crash, but here's a guy who lived through the greatest hyperinflation of any modern industrial economy and ended up as the richest man in Germany because he saw it coming and made the right move. So again, we're not helpless. We can do things about it. But the key to empowerment, as I say, is to see it coming. That's where the analysis comes in. And you're like, um, gee, you know, Jim, are you smarter than everybody else? Of course not. Uh, there are a lot of big brains around, but um, people have flawed models. There's a lot of um, behavioral psychology behind it, you know, the you know, confirmation bias or believing the future will resemble the past, which it usually does not. And uh, so if you're going to stick to those models, yeah, you're going to get really bad results. It's hard to think of an institution that has a worse forecasting record than the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve, with the possible exception of the IMF. They're both pretty bad. I mean, you could almost take the Fed forecast do the opposite and, and be just fine. There's more to it than that, but they just stick to these really bad models. But if you understand how the economy really works, if you understand it's a complex dynamic system, all I've done is I've taken complexity theory, which has been around for a while. I mean, you can say 13 billion years because the Big Bang was uh, you know, the ultimate complex dynamic uh, paradigm shift or a phase transition. But the science of complexity uh, understood mathematical terms really dates to kind of the early 60s. But it's been used very successfully in uh, physics. Um, it has a lot of applications. All I did was bring it over to capital markets. I looked at capital markets and said, wait a second, here's, a, here's one of the most uh, complex dynamic systems you can picture. And then there's nothing more complex than the human brain. So you're putting humans on top of capital markets. You've got complexity squared or some exponent. Um, and those models work brilliantly. But try getting anyone to understand it or, or do that work is difficult. But but again, the point is, if you have the right models, and I would include behavioral psychology, a good dose of history, complexity theory, and a few other branches of applied mathematics, you can get very good results. But if you stick to, you know, the Phillips curve and non-accelerating inflation, unemployment rate, and uh, a lot of other nonsense the Fed uses, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get it wrong. Um, does the the future resemble the past? with some probability, some degree of distribution probability. Not always. I mean, and maybe less frequently now than ever. And they also assume that prices move continuously. You know, prices go up and down, of course, but uh, markets don't move continuously. Or if they do, it's when you don't care. When you do care, they just gap. They gap, gap down or they gap up. You miss it, you blink, and it's at a completely different level. It's been repriced. Now you can still get in and out, but you've either made a lot of money or lost a lot of money you know, in the blink of an eye. So when you take those characteristics, and this is how I started kind of, you know, deconstructing it, if you will, and said, well, look, markets are not efficient. That's nonsense. They don't move continuously and slowly. They gap up and they gap down. And if you're not ready for that, you've missed the boat. Um, nothing's risk-free, so why don't we start there? When I started identifying those factors that, in my view, were incorrectly applied, um, and you say, well, what what looks like that? Well, the answer is a complex dynamic system. You know, a system that produces hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning bolts and power outages and earthquakes and tsunamis. Those are all examples of the results of complex dynamic systems. An earthquake doesn't sneak up on you. It just 
you know, it just, <laughs> the ground falls out from under you instantly. And that's what happens in markets. So then I said, well, maybe that's a better model. Of course it, it, it is. Things evolve all the time. You, you uh, another tool, intellectual tool, applied mathematical tool uses Bayes theorem without getting too much in the weeds. Uh, and I learned Bayes theorem at the CIA because uh, I always say, if, if you have all the facts, a smart high school kid can solve the problem. The intelligence agencies and others, and people in capital markets, have to solve problems when you don't have all the facts. But you have no choice in, in national security or defense. It's, it's literally life or death. On Wall Street, it could be uh, you know your fortune or your client's uh, fortune. So you don't have the luxury of just throwing up your hands and say, "Well, I'm going to wait till I get more facts." Uh, that's what Janet Yellen did, but uh, that doesn't work in the, in the in the real world. She's kind of detached from that. So how do you solve problems when you don't have all the facts you need to really solve the problem, and you know it, but you have, but you have to deal with it anyway because it's it's coming at you. Well, Bayes' theorem says um, assign an initial probability, a, a priori assumption, just not make it up, but do the best you can, recognizing that you're going to fall short, that you've got missing pieces in the puzzle, if you want to put it that way. And if you have no facts at all, and it's a binary outcome, give it 50-50. Like, uh, you know, it's like, um, it's not quite 50-50, but red or black on a roulette table, it's, you know, it's a little less than 50-50. It was close enough. You said, it's either going to be red or black, don't know which, I'm going to give it a 50-50. And then what you do, and this is what statisticians hate, you update it based on subsequent facts. As new facts come in, you put them back in the model, you update it, and what you'll discover is that your probability either goes up or down. Well, if it goes down more than you know a certain amount, you discard it. You say, well, that's wrong. I just do it again. But if it goes up, what you're doing is making it more and more likely that your assumption was true. And so eventually you can get up to the 80, 90% level. Now that's not 100%, but it's pretty darn good. But there's there's a tension, which is okay as you're updating, uh, and this is something that was explained to me by Henry Kissinger. So imagine a simple graph, and the you know the the vertical axis, the y-axis is uh, the probability of a certain outcome, and the x-axis is a timeline. Basically, the you convert that into the amount of information you have. How much information do I have? How much time do I have to make a decision? Well, at zero at the outset, you have no information or very little. But you have a lot of time. You have a lot of degrees of freedom. But as you move across the x-axis, as you move down the timeline, what you discover is you get more and more information, which is a good thing. So that curve is going up. But you have less and less time, fewer degrees of freedom. That curve is going down. So when you get all the way to the other end, it's like, hey, I have perfect information, but it's too late. It's over. I, I miss either you know war started or I lost all my money or something bad happened. So what you look for is the sweet spot in the middle, call it the Kissinger cross, where I have enough information to be smart, but enough time to have degrees of freedom and be able to act. You look for that sweet spot in the middle and that's when you act. And you know, you, with a little, humility is, is a very good uh, uh, tool, a good addition to the formula. So in, in as I say, in the CIA, you, you never have enough information. You're always trying to get more, but you, you have to do the best you can uh, and, and kind of make assumptions and make forecasts because you don't have the luxury of sitting back. You can't wait for 10 9-11 events so you can have a good statistical base. You got one and you want to prevent the next one. Small ebook, big impact, the wealth tree, the only four ways that will make you financially free forever. Download it here for free.